Living the Faith podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, restoringthefaith.com. Welcome back to another episode of Living the Faith, coming at you with Joe and Mike here in studio, and calling in today, we have Tom. I'll be honest, guys, um, we really did not plan to record a show at all during Holy Week. We wanted to take the entire week off. We had pre-recorded our show about Holy Week and some other topics which we had planned to release during this week. But unfortunately, the events of Holy Monday have uh, forced our hand and brought us back here um, into the studio to talk a little bit about the fire in Notre Dame and um, the loss, the extreme loss to our Catholic heritage and our Catholic patrimony, which is... Difficult to overstate, I would say. And as we sit here today in studio, um, we're recording on Tuesday, so we have a little bit more information available to us. Joe, it seems like the entire thing is not going to be destroyed. And uh, although we spent a whole day wondering if the crown of thorns would be saved, if the if the nails from the cross would be saved, if, if the pieces of true cross... All of the art, all of the sacred relics and artifacts and history, well, a lot of that's unclear at this point, but we do know that the crown of thorns survived. So we, we do have something of a, of a modern-day hero. Um, Father Fournier um, is a, a traditional Catholic priest who joined the uh, French Fire Brigade, the Par- Parisian Fire Brigade, and um, he arrived on the scene um, I don't know what happened between him arriving on the scene and him dashing inside the cathedral and retrieving the Blessed Sacrament and uh, grabbing the crown of thorns on the way out and uh, coming outside um, with literally Christ and the thorns that penetrated his head um, on Good Friday. Pretty symbolic, considering that all happened on Monday of Holy Week. I mean, of course, we don't look for signs and wonders as, as Catholics, and yet this is this is too much to be a coincidence. We don't know at this point um, what caused the fire. Uh, that people speculate that it, it could have been um, as a result of the construction. I know that when you have um, arc welding involved, you've got very flammable gases. You have extremely high temperature equipment. Um, that could very well be the case. It, it could be um, an intentional attack on the church. We know that there have been several attacks on churches across France um, by uh, Islamists over the last five years. Um, you have, of course, had the, the attack in Nice, France, which was fairly lethal, and the attempted attack on Notre Dame by um, members affiliated with ISIS within the last two years. Even, uh, I believe, was it Sans Sulpice or was it Sacre Coeur? Of recent memory, that there was a fire lit inside one of those cathedrals. I saw that on the news as well, that this was not the first church fire that had been in recent memory inside right. Paris. Well, they tried to burn Notre Dame to the ground. They tried to use fire as a weapon. Um, the uh, the ISIS fighters did. But this is such a grave loss um, for our culture and for... <laughs> For the people of God, um, for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, France has a privileged place, or at least has historically held a, pri- a privileged place within the context of the Catholic Church and within the context of Christendom. Of course, many of the greatest saints and and the greatest rulers that we've ever had in in our in our church's history have been French by blood, and France was the first uh, barbarian tribe of Europe to convert. Of course, under the Merovingian kings, um, started under the line of Clovis and his wife Clotilde, um, and and not culminating, but certainly a a, a huge chapter uh, would be the the Carolingian kings, um, Charles Martel, Pepin the Short, and then Charlemagne, Charles the Great, which we've already done a show about. But France has given us such a beautiful patrimony. Um, I mean, how, how how can we find words, Tom, to even describe the 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 loss from this week? And I think, 
And, and I think that maybe the, the big thing is that people don't really realize what a loss this is. I think that the news goes, hey, isn't this great news? Uh, of course, this is an historic building. And of course, the news is going to take it from purely historical, not not religious at all, or or borderline religious kind of nodding. Oh, sure, this is important religious, but it's more important because it's historical. And they'll say, oh, the roof burned. And, you know, that's about it. So no big deal. Everything's fine. Sure, there's a little damage inside. And while it is true that the, the building has not been completely raised to the ground, hasn't been destroyed beyond repair, the fact is that this is this is serious and that the fact that so much damage happened and in fact at, at, up to this point that since you know, all the damage really happened yesterday I, I think everyone is still ascertaining just how bad it really is but the point is um that such a sacred edifice of god is on fire for such a long time that's that's pretty that's pretty heartbreaking yeah and 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 that it happened at the beginning of holy week i mean that's pretty that's not an insignificant fact of all the days for it to for the fire to occur. I mean, it's it's not just a random day, you know. After, uh, um, you know, some other feast or mm-hmm. in or on a feria day or or whatever. And it it is a veritable treasure chest of Christendom. One of one of the main um, treasure chests of Christendom that burned. And it, it, it houses, at least it did house, 1,600 different relics of the saints. At, of um, our, our, I know Our Lady's Veil has been there many, uh, many times before. I'm not sure that it was there at this point in time. Um, the true, uh, a, a very large piece of the True Cross was housed there. And then culminating in the greatest relic, which we aforementioned, is the crown of thorns, um, which I've had the pleasure of venerating in person. That was just tremendous um, to to be that close to a such a. I mean, literally touching Christ's head, piercing his head. Um, it, it, it was sublime. All right, so uh, a little bit about uh, Notre Dame de Paris. What does that phrase even mean? And um, what, let's get into the history of the edifice. So despite the fact that this is a very grave um, incident, um, I will give a lighter anecdote to the story to say that uh, my father and my mother were on vacation uh, many years ago in uh, Canada, and um, my father was plugging into the GPS, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, and plugging it in, trying to find the way there to this particular church where they were going to go to Mass. And my mother's like, oh, there it is. And, and my father's like, what? No, 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 we're, we're 20 miles away. What are you talking about? She said, well, that's at Notre Dame. And then there's like, no, that's not it. And then they drove for a little while longer, and she's like, oh, the, the, there it is. No, no, that's no, no, that's that's not it. What what are you talking about? She said it says Notre Dame, and he says, "Do do you do you know what Notre Dame means?" And she said, "No, it means Our Lady, literally Notre uh, in the French uh, is Our and Dame, uh, or you know in the uh, old English would be the Dame uh, is Lady. So it is literally Our Lady. So you have Notre Dame de Paris, you have Notre Dame de Chartres." Notre Dame de Rheim, uh, all the m- major cathedrals, if I'm not mistaken, in um, in France, are begin with Notre Dame. Now, this is a building. It's widely reported that it's 800 or 850 years old. Um, people are people are uh, sort of talking about the history on in the mainstream media um, on the news and saying, "Wow, you know, this thing was was begun uh, at some point in the 12th century." Um, what 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 do we know about the the just the history of the edifice, Tom? Well, I think that um, as far as the as far as the edifice goes itself, the cathedral that what what we see today, what's what's left of it, and and we shouldn't be so glum because it's not like, again, it's not like there's a pile of rubble from from all reports and from the photos. Most of the structure is still intact. Um, basically, just the roof was destroyed. The, wo- the wooden roof, which honestly is not really that old, it's only a few hundred years old at most. 
And so um, the the church itself, what we see today, is obviously is not is is not the product of a single day or a week or even a year or even a few years of work. We're talking. Um, over a hundred years of work to bring it to this point, and even even before that time, uh, the building the building the um, highly gothic ornate style of of the cathedral was based off of, or, or I should say, there was a previous uh, Romanesque style cathedral uh, before that, which in it, which itself was based off of the ruins of a pagan temple. Again, very a very Catholic tradition at that time to take these old pagan temples and to and to christianize them to catholicize them by destroying the temple and then building a church to to sanctify the ground and just to maybe to uh reiterate to the to the people who were living there at the time the old the, do, not, do not don't worship the false gods this is this is that temple of the true god and to say you used to worship here in this space now worship in the in the correct space in the cathedral so that's uh, certainly there's a lot more to talk about it, but kind of in a nutshell, that's it. So this is a product of quite a lot of, of effort and, and cost, of course. Wow. So is, that's, that's sort of like the uh, Pantheon in Rome where mass is celebrated. Um, but of course, the Pantheon uh, harkens back to the, um, the worship of all the Roman gods and the edifice has since been baptized and, and made Catholic. So you're saying that Notre Dame, in fact, uh, sits upon the same site as a pagan temple, which was later built or rebuilt in the um, um, architecturally, there's a, there's a phrase called Romanesque, which refers to um, a style that um, it, in, in the post-Roman uh, era uh, harkened back to Roman styling. And then it was actually, it was actually France which invented the Gothic, the Gothic style for church buildings. And um, perhaps Notre Dame is um, one of the best examples of that style. So there's a lot more history here than just the fact that, you know, King Louis the seventh ordered the construction of this thing in the mid 1160s and um that it took how i mean how how much money would it take to build this thing these days they estimated in today's dollars spent back then it would be uh, the equivalent of over a billion dollars a billion dollars yeah that's that's just a staggering fact to me because if you think about it at the time Sure, there were kings and princes, and I'm sure a lot of the money to build this cathedral came from them. But, of course, it was, it's talked about that that just the peasants, the, the everyday people, came and they contributed their money as much as they could afford. They contributed their time, certainly. They contributed their skill if they were uh, um, maybe master stonemasons, master carpenters, all these different type of people who are highly skilled, painters and so on, to decorate the inside. Um, and just... It, it's it's staggering that it's not oh I'm a billionaire or here's a billion dollars go go build this cathedral but it was a penny from you and a penny from you and a penny from you and all together all this money came together because the people realized it doesn't matter how they live but the house of God is the most important thing and money is no is no object whatsoever. I've heard it said that the age of faith really. Uh encompasses the period from like uh, the, the 12th century until the 15th century. Um, and that was, this was, this was the, the peak of Christendom and the time in which almost everyone in the European continent was truly Catholic and took their faith seriously. And to your point, Tom, would contribute everything they could, would dig deep until it hurt to build these beautiful cathedrals to dignify the house of God, that God would dwell in a cathedral such as this. Um, it's just staggering. The, 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 loss, the loss here, um, even if it's just um, pieces of it, we don't know at this point. We don't know which of those 1,600 relics were destroyed. We don't know if every side chapel um, and, and the presence of our Lord was... was uh, saved from from every possible place and even in the crypt. We 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 don't know a lot at this point. Um but what we do know is that the the damage has been done and um and the entire world is watching as the flames consumed a major portion of the history of Christendom. 
I, I think that we're understating a little bit with regards to the roof. Um, and this, we will cover this in the next section. Um, but the construction of a cathedral is such that the, uh, um, the, the building of the new roof, um, the roof is actually very, very critical to the structure of a cathedral in a way in which it's built. So there is actually the, there is a tremendous amount of instability right now in the structure as a result. If you, if you look at some of the pictures, you'll see that the, um, let's see, it's facing east. So it would be the southern wall is actually leaning in a little bit. Um, and, you know, for that to be even a little bit as a cathedral, that's as, especially as tall as it is with the buttresses holding it back, that's a big, big, big deal. Um, and again, like you said, Mike, we don't know the full extent of the damage, but I don't want, I want to make sure for the sake of our listeners that we're not understating the amount of the damage that is actually done with the roof um, caving in, especially of the transept. On the other side maybe, of the break. Maybe, I'm sorry, maybe to, maybe to just, I was thinking about this and trying to say, how, how is there another way to, to state the damage? And maybe the best way to think about it is, if you went to a, a really famous museum of natural history, for example, maybe one of the, um, maybe Rosetta Stone, and you took a hammer and chipped off just a little bit of it. Sure, it's mostly still there, but that's a priceless loss. And sure, we have photographs. Sure, we could probably reconstruct it as much as possible. But, but if you took a hammer to the Rosetta Stone, people would say, what have you done? You've destroyed history. Look at how priceless we can never get this back. In a certain, and, and so that's just for a small object. So maybe expand that. Maybe that's, maybe that's a good way to kind of set in seriousness how, how bad this damage to the cathedral is. Even if we lost one fresco on the wall or one, one chunk of pillar, it's still priceless in that same sort of way. So there's been irreparable damage to a billion-dollar institution. On the other side of the break, we're, we're going to understand exactly what, what goes into that billion dollars, why the cathedral is so elaborate, and some of the nuts and bolts involved in running one of these things. At Restoring the Faith Media, we believe we are the barbarians living in the ruins of a superior civilization. Our mission is to reconstitute the splendor of our ancient Catholic faith. We're building a library of inspiring, thoughtful, and previously lost content. Join us in this endeavor. Visit RestoringTheFaith.com. All right, so we've been talking about the damage um, structurally and and uh, if not metaphysically to <laughs> our psychology as a result of what's happened uh, to Notre Dame in Paris. Um, and the, pre- the president of France, Macron, he's come out and said that he's got a bold vision for rebuilding this thing, Joe, in five years. How realistic is that? Uh, well, seeing as how they won't actually be able to... Um, reproduce the efforts of an age that we've lost all the skill and the tech to actually reproduce. I would say that um, five years, I can't even say is saying generous because it's, I don't actually believe that it's possible. Yeah. I mean, no, this is, this is basically for Catholics. This is our nine 11. I mean, this is, this is a staggering loss to the patrimony of the church. And um, right. if we if we find out, for example, that this was indeed an act of terrorism. I mean, that that has that should have that should have reverberations within our consciences that um you know, what <laughs> it's been centuries since since we would have sustained such a loss as this. Now, to your point, where, where you say about both, both Mike and Joe, you're talking about how serious the damage is and so on, and about 
there's the possibility that the cathedral could collapse, maybe it could be destroyed. Um, and you're saying we don't have the knowledge of these techniques and so on. I, I, I don't disagree with any of these points. It's absolutely true. We certainly don't have the knowledge of the techniques. Even even with modern technology, even with the best of the best, there's no way we can reproduce that, that exact style. However, I would say during World War II, hundreds of churches were destroyed, partially damaged in, in all different states of repair, and some, of course, were, were just left left alone and nothing happened. But I would argue that many were completely rebuilt. And in fact, to this day, um, in, in parts of Eastern Europe especially, which is what I'm most familiar with, these buildings, you can't even tell there was a war because they've been rebuilt so perfectly. For example, in Poland, lots of churches were absolutely destroyed such that there was there was no there was no recollection of what they actually how they actually could re- be rebuilt and so they for example there's a, a famous church in, in Poland that uh, they had to study 14th century the church is from the 1300s they had to study 14th century um, architectural diagrams from old libraries from the from the monastic libraries and they decided to rebuild the church in that style that it had been that it had originally been constructed and of course there were the updates and changes over the years and you go to this church nowadays and again Poland of course a great catholic country they spent the time they spent the money they made the effort and these churches now stand there and you wouldn't have noticed anything anything at, at all out of place I certainly not, hope not, that the French people can muster the willpower to uh, to replicate this exact line of efforts. I certainly hope that um, that that the Bishop of Paris and that the bishops um, in in France and that the people of France will uh, will assemble a, a, a team of people who are talented and dedicated in the same way that the re, the post. World War rebuilding effort in in uh, Eastern Europe went. Another uh, interesting comment that I saw in the news with respect to the, the the Second World War was that a lot of the onlookers in in Paris who were of course singing um, hymns to Our Lady uh, as they stood there aghast watching this edifice ablaze, they said not even the Nazis had the audacity to destroy this important building. I mean, it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm kind of curious, Joe, and and I don't know if we can kind of jump into this for the sake of um, a lot of our listeners. What is a cathedral? Why why is this called a cathedral? And what is, what, what is, there's a word called etymology, which is like the history of a word. What is the etymology? I guess we can start there of a cathedral. Certainly. So, Explaining what a cathedral is and all the symbolism that's behind it is is very broad, and uh, I I know that Thomas will be able to back me up on uh, a lot of this. Um, but the basic um, summary that I can give, first of all, to say uh, the etymology comes from the Latin cathedra, um, the equivalent of word of the word in German uh, is dom, um, but that is to say that it is the uh, cathedra in Latin means seat. And so it is the principal church of the diocese, the seat of the bishop of the entire diocese. This is where, this is the bishop's church. This is the the uh, parish church, so to speak, of the bishop. This is where the, the confirmations would take place en masse. Um, you can go to a website called uh, gallica.br, I believe, uh, just search Gallica online, and you can find pictures, black and white pictures, gorgeous, gorgeous pictures that were taken at the turn of the century in the early 1900s of these mass holy communions and mass uh, confirmations and these processions that were miles long, the entirety of the Parisian populace turning out uh, in these events or the feast day of St. Jean of Arc, uh, which is the... Uh, Patron, patroness of France, or one of the patronesses of France. Mm-hmm. Um, so the cathedral was the center of the life of a city that had one, right? So one of these capitals are, are major cities like Rheims or uh, Chartres. Um, they would have this cathedral, and so the, the most important relics of the city would be there. This was the seat of the bishop. This was the, the center of the faith. This was the life of the city, was the cathedral. Um, 
And and any of the any of the French kings would have been crowned there. Actually, in this in this particular case, it was a uh, as a matter of tradition. This was um, done in Chem. Uh, this is, oh, of course, yes, right. But in this in the in this in this particular country, obviously in France, that yeah. this would this would probably be different in 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 different countries. Um, but yes, I mean for the city itself. Um, this is where all the most important things would uh, occur, uh, or the most important things would occur, uh, outside of some traditional practices. Uh, just for the sake of the listeners, Rem is where all the tradi- uh, traditionally where all the kings have been crowned because that's where uh, King Clovis was baptized right. and and crowned. So, looking at the uh, various. Uh, clerics who would be involved in in upkeeping the cathedral. You've got a whole litany of of different folks who would be, uh, for lack of a better word, stationed there. This is where they would report for their daily duties. This is where they would offer their daily masses on, on any of the various uh, chapels there or altars. Um, could, could you give us a sense of who those people might be? Well, it might uh, might help to back up for a second and just remember that in the church, of course, we're very familiar with bishops, with the pope, of course, um, who, in, who, of course, is a bishop, but the bishop of Rome, head of the church, of course, but so bishop is, is ultimately the highest rank of, of um, in, the, in the clergy. There's bishops, priests, um, and, and then we're all familiar with deacons and subdeacons, but we need to remember there are other minor orders uh, before the priesthood. And so when um, a man is in the seminary studying to be a priest— uh, he'll receive these minor orders along the way. Um, they're not, it's not the priesthood, but it's, it's stepping stones along the way. And all of these orders were very much historical. And by, by kind of looking at each of these orders, we can get a sense of the different people who would be in the church. And so, of course, a cleric is kind of a general term to say any person, any man consecrated to God who is destined to become a priest at, at some time or another or at least studying along that path. And so uh, the, the very first, the first rung is the porter. And so this person, by, by nature of the sacred, uh, sacred uh, orders, has, uh, has a duty to open and shut the doors, to ring the bells, to call the people to prayer. Uh, then one step above the porter is the lector. And the lector is the person, lector, to, to read, is the, is the Latin word. The lector has the duty to read, to educate the faithful, uh, kind of a, a, a catechist, as you will, if, if you will. Uh, and this person would also have the privilege to read certain of the sacred texts allowed during ceremonies, not the epistle, not the gospel during the mass, of course, was reserved for the, for the, the priest, the deacon, the subdeacon. Uh, but then, but some of the other lessons, maybe during the sacred office, porter, lector, then we have the exorcist. And the exorcist, as, it, as the name implies, was given the power to exorcise the demons. And it's kind of astounding that you think that we're just three three rungs up the ladder. We're not close to priesthood yet, and this man has the power to cast out the devils. Again, then going up a further level is the acolyte, whose whose sole task was to minister at the altar, to serve the bishop, to serve the priest, and to perform the sacred functions in the sacred ceremonies. Then we get to the, the levels that we're familiar with, the subdeacon, the deacon, the priest, and all of these people are all in service to the bishop, to the whoever the bishop or the archbishop, or perhaps it's a cardinal, um, who, whoever might be stationed, who's, whose cathedral it is, might help to think of the cathedral like the White House. The, the president is in charge, and he has lots of people running around doing, doing all the subtasks that the president can't personally take care of. And so make that comparison to say that the bishop, whoever, whoever that bishop is, is the president of that diocese, of that geographic area, and he has the priest to, of course, offer masses at various times during the day to, to minister to the faithful, to attend the sick and dying, to catechize, to, to do all this type of all the functions of running a, a, a parish and caring for the souls of people. And, and the reason in the hundreds of thousands. Right. And, and the reason why I use the German equivalent word, which is dome, is it represents it is the house of God. And the bishop is a representative in that diocese of God, and he has a household. So all of these duties and tasks that are required for a household, a, a sp- specifically the house of God, to function, you have an entire household of 
um, servants of God. That's quite a bustling household. In fact, it's um, it's uh, an amalgamated uh, grouping of people, um, and not just the not just the not just the personalities that you're going to find in a cathedral, but the objects, the sacred objects. Um, we should speak to probably the precious relics, which would be housed in any cathedral, generally speaking, right? Absolutely. So, like I mentioned before, Notre Dame was the home of 1,600 plus relics. Um, there, of course, there are the relics that are on the altar. There are relics in side chapels. Um, there, are, in in the case of Notre Dame, there is the sacristy, and inside the sacristy, there are a a large assortment of these. Uh, relics. A sacristy is a lot more than what we're used to. In a sacristy, is in where the the where where the priest gets dressed, where they store the blessed ves- uh, the sacred vessels, etc. But it it, it was um, kind it was kind of the, the the command center for the entire cathedral. Um, so all the sacred relics, or even uh, in the case of Notre Dame, which I was also pleased to hear that the the tunic that was worn by Saint Louis the Ninth was housed in the sacristy as well. Um, it, it, it's, Do we know if that one, if that's safe? It, it did, and it, 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 wow. was, it was retrieved without a burn or anything like that. So that was, blessed be God. Yeah, Blessed indeed. be God. So, indeed. It, so, you, so you would have, like, you would have the most splendid, the most excellent relics in the entire diocese or archdiocese housed here. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, just like any normal sacristy, of course, in, inside the cathedral, they have all the vestments, etc. cetera, uh, the, the, the countless number of literally hundreds and hundreds of year old vestments that are only taken out uh, in the, they haven't been taken out in a very long time, but uh, they've been housed there. Uh, and you can see them, or you were able to see them in person. Um, just extraordinary, extraordinary pieces of, of clothing for the servants of God. Okay, so we've talked about uh, the various people who would be in service of the cathedral. We've touched on the sacred objects which would be contained therein. What about the physical infrastructure of the cathedral, the, uh, the edifice itself? Um, how, how does one distinguish a, the, perhaps the shape of a cathedral from the shape of any other standard parish church? Well, I think the most important the most uh, important and striking aspect of the church is cathedrals always have a very a very prominent cross shape. Uh, when visible from the air, they always have, it, it looks very much like a cross. And uh, the parts of the church have very interesting names. The parts of the cathedral have very interesting names, and they're all very very nautical in a certain sense. They have, they're, they're like parts of a ship, because we need to remember that Holy Mother Church is the ark, like the ark of Noah, the ship, the ship of salvation, outside of which it's not possible to be saved. There's the, there's the wave. And so bringing all the faithful into the ship uh, to, to bring them safely to the, to the kingdom of heaven. So we'll have the, um, the, 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 the long upright vertical looking at the cross, looking at the, the cross shape of the church, the long upright vertical part called the nave um, from the Latin word for, for ship. Again, bringing back this, Sorry, bringing back this um, idea that the ship, that the church is the ship leading souls to heaven. Yeah, you and, better you better get on board, or uh, or you're gonna drown. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like the uh, that's that's the theme here, right? It's pretty absolutely. choppy waters out there too. For for sure, for sure. And so then the then the sidebars of the church, the the left and right arms of the cross are called transepts. And uh, those transepts might have one more side chapel. Uh, and in fact, all around the outside of the church, of course, of course, the major part of the, of the church is the high altar. Uh, and this is the part in the sanctuary where the holy sacrifice, uh, holy sacrifice of the Mass is offered. And that's probably the most visible, most striking part that you'd see. And I believe you'd have to, I'd have to double check on, check, check my um, definitions on this, but I believe a cathedral is either required or entitled to have a baldacchino that is a sort of a miniature roof covering the altar. So if you think of St. Peter's mm-hmm. Cathedral in Rome, uh, when you walk inside, you see the giant, giant high altar right in the middle of the church. And there are the huge four twisted columns, the very famous sculptural columns. And then there's a sort of a roof over that 
far below the actual roof of the church. Right. And so that's not just – that's not for decoration, but that's a, that has a very uh, a specific symbolic meaning. And again, I forget if it's a requirement or if it's merely uh, permitted for those churches. So, for example, a smaller parish church is not permitted to have a baldocchino. It could have smaller, lesser decorations. I think the preliminary reports, um, and, and it's not clear exactly at this point, but the preliminarily we know that the high altar at Notre Dame was, in fact, saved. It's intact. So the main altar was intact. Correct, which is, I, I think, a miracle. I think some of the other altars did not fare so well, but at least the historical high altar is still there. Um, okay, so... We kind of know now that the cathedral is shaped like a cross. It's got all these special privileges. It's a bustling household full of uh, very hardworking people. It is the uh, it is the uh, place to house all of the most important things in the diocese. What went into making these things historically? It took, as we mentioned before, over a billion dollars of those of that currency's time. Um, but this was an entire work of the city of Paris and the surrounding areas and uh, art- artisans from all over France to build this. It took over a hundred years to build this cathedral. That's a staggering number. I mean, especially when you consider the fact that in the 12th and 13th and 14th century, your average lifespan was not 85 years old. Right, right. And so every single day, if you've, if you've seen Notre Dame before, you will know that if you walk up to the structure, no matter where you walk up to the structure, everything, of course, there's always some decay with time, but you can tell that every single detail, every single curl and flourish of every edge was made perfectly. There's a beautiful story. Um, I, I believe it was a, a cleric. Uh, was walking into the church during its construction, and uh, he saw this um, man who was behind one of the hundreds of statues that adorn each of the doors um, in in Notre Dame, and he was behind one of these small statues' heads, and he was chiseling away behind this statue's head, and uh, he... The, the cleric looks up at the man, the, the artisan there, and he says, Monsieur, uh, why are you paying so much attention to that little detail? And he turns back at him and somewhat kind of surprised at the, at the cleric and then looks up at the heaven. He says, Ah, but Monsieur, the Lord knows. Mm-hmm. And this is for God. This is what... People in all ranges of all uh, of the society that existed, all bent uh, over to get this done perfectly. You may have you may have known that you could spend your entire life working on Notre Dame for for the enjoyment and benefit of your grandchildren or your great grandchildren. You would have known that you would have potentially never been alive to see the thing finished. And or that y- your children would not see it. And yet you would happily have given the, f- the, <laughs> the labor of your entire lifetime to build this thing. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. So commissioning a, an edifice like this was, is no small act. It's a pretty big deal. Right. So in, in speaking about this, you know, there's so many people reacting to this right now with, with horror to see this, this icon of Paris being destroyed, right? But that's pretty much the the surface that they scratch in this regard, they do not understand. They cannot comprehend. A lot of people I know are still horrified, but they're not even quite sure beyond that what what happened. And the, the, the devotion of these people to spend their entire lives, and not just the people who built it, but the people who prayed in it and lived around it, and that was part of their life. This is part of an entire culture. And that something like this to happen, we, we have a tendency to still, and I'm saying it here, about the people, but it is a house of God. And that they, lo- they don't have 
any sight of this, that this beautiful, beautiful monument that was built for God's greater honor and glory in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary is being, uh, has been burnt, has, has been, in effect, destroyed. It would be difficult, too, to not um, t- try to interpret some kind of symbolism from the events um, and viewed through the lens of, of Catholic thought and Catholic history it would be hard for us to not look at what happened and say and wonder out loud whether or not of course everything that happens in the world is is the will of god either through his active or his permissive will and so a, a grave evil like this clearly was willed by god through his permissive will he didn't set it on fire but he allowed it to be burnt down and one has to wonder out loud whether or not that particular decision is the result of anything perhaps done by modern man or by the French people um, or, or any other such thing. I mean, we know as Catholics that the French Revolution is really the culmination of, of such a grouping of pernicious errors, which to this day reverberate throughout the church, and that the French turned away from God. And look, this is not, uh, we're not sitting here saying we're, we're blaming the French people for this fire, that that would not be the interpretation of this, of this particular uh, line of thinking. But I would wonder, Tom, if, if it would be, you know, appropriate for us to take a step back and wonder about, hey, you know, there is no birth rate in France. There is no marriage rate. The mass attendance is at an, at an all-time low. Um, the, the, the city of Paris is effectively a Muslim city. Um, there are places where um, Catholics and um, European-blooded people can't even go. I saw a study recently that, um, that you know, they don't keep very good uh, birth rate statistics there, but one of the proxies for uh, figuring out whether or not the, the, the children being born in France are <laughs> indeed of of French blood or not, one of the proxies is sickle cell anemia because this is a disease which uniquely um, is is present in non-European blood, in African blood. So um, nine out of 10 babies born in France, this is a study, have this gene carry this trait for sickle cell anemia, which would tell you that nine out of 10 babies born to this day in France are not of European blood. France, as we know it, will be no more within a generation if this trend holds true. And so, Tom, I mean, am I totally off my rocker here and in, in no, trying I, to extrapolate I, some kind of theme from this? I think I think that a, at, at the whole point of the show, the whole point of living the, living the faith is, as you said in, in one of the shows recently, is we don't want to focus on any one thing too much. And I think it's really easy for a lot of people to try and say, What's this? Let me read something into this. Let me let me try to figure out some kind of motive and meaning and hidden hidden conspiracy behind everything. We're not about that at all. But the point is to say things happen for a reason. Things happen for and we should learn as much as we can. And I think you could say France's attitude is non-Catholic and Notre Dame is one of the Catholic jewels of France. And so if France chooses not to be Catholic, it shouldn't have Catholic treasures anymore. They hired and, a they hired a socialist president. I mean, th- this is not Catholic. Macron is completely anti-Catholic. It is completely New World Order. Um, it, it, it's this focus on um, on a, on a neo communism. That's what we're that's what we're dealing with inside of France right now. So, I, I mean, we, we just got got to call a spade a spade. I agree with you that we're not trying to focus on um, the uh, tremendous horrific things that are going on in the church today but uh, th- this is this is a just a societal fact as uh, that we need to recognize as Catholics and we need to recognize it as a society that these things happen for a reason and you could regardless of whether or not this was an actual attack it definitely seems pos- at the very least, that there is a message that is being sent by God in his permissive will 
mm-hmm. to allow this as a as a reckoning, as a as a as a call sign, as as a a, a warning of what is going on in the world today. As we um, interact with people in our daily lives, uh, people at work, um, you know, people that we run into um, outside of church or whatever, people who are non-Catholic, everybody will have the opinion that this is a treasure of humanity and that it has been lost um, or at least damaged in a, in a way that is could be irreparable. And everybody will say that it is beautiful. No other faith in the world has produced beauty that is objectively so good that would warrant people spending their vacations and their discretionary income to go and sit in the presence of this beauty. And let us hope that in the reconstruction that is to occur for Notre Dame, that not only is she physically reconstructed, but that the principles which undergirded her design and her loving construction and that those principles would be resurrected in France in the same way that perhaps the wooden beams of the roof will be resurrected. And let us hope that this will be a warning sign that is heeded from God because I think that this could just be the tip of the iceberg for all of Christendom. No response to that. There was no response to that. I'm just glaring at you, Mike. This is this is this is not the end. This this is what's going to happen here is they are not going to be able to faithfully restore it. And I don't think that the intent is to actually restore it to its former glory. They're going to turn this into some the new Taj version. Mahoney, the Taj Mahoney, yeah. which is the the cathedral <clears throat> in in Los Angeles, it, which it, it, that's that's just not what's going to happen. You have Macron no. saying that we're going to make this better and more beautiful than it already was. You cannot do that today. Take away the skill; the intent is gone. The intent is gone to actually preserve the patrimony of the Catholic faith. They're not Catholic. They hate the Catholic faith, and that's it. They're not going to go spend billions of or, or you know, millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars that have already been pledged. Tim Cook is is participating in this. You think that that's he, a bad sign? Yeah, that's a bad sign. All right, like I was talking with my godfather last night, and he was just saying, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to be surprised if there's an apple with a bite out of it over the freaking main altar for crying out loud. Like that is, th- 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 this is a tragedy that we do not have the will as a people, because they do not understand, they do not love God, they hate God as a nation, and and we as the in the world. Yeah. This is this is the problem that we face today. This is a real problem. And and at the at the very least, we could say that this is a sign from God to say, you can't have this anymore. You are not you are not um uh, uh, worthy of of containing this sacrifice that so many people spent their entire Catholic lives building in my honor. Yeah, and Macron is going to come and make it better and more beautiful. Get out of here. No, I mean I think your I think your uh, passion and your um, and your opinion are totally justified on this matter. And um, it's it it could be easy for us to stick our heads in the ground as as Catholics particularly as conservative Catholics, for us to put our head in the sand and say, well, gosh, I hope, gee golly whiz, I hope that they do build it um, as beautiful as it was before. I hope that somebody had some pictures and they build it true to form. Tom, is 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 Joe getting worked up for no reason here, or um, or should we be pretty, pretty skeptical about these dollars that are going <laughs> to allegedly rebuild? Well, I, while I disagree with some of the points that he made, I have to say, ultimately, I completely agree. Regardless of skill, regardless of money, regardless of, of whatever, the intent is not going to be there because we unfortunately don't live in the age of faith. That's, 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 you can't argue that point. And the, the fact is that uh, some little woodcarver carving a little angel's face into every single wooden beam that maybe no one ever saw 
is certainly not the same as hiring a team of the absolute best, the fastest construction workers, maybe the most skillful plasters, the still skillful stonemasons, carvers, whatever. The fact is they're doing it for the money. They would be doing it for the money. And sure, of course, maybe there are some Catholics in there who would be doing it because they see it as their chance to give back to the church, to, to, to help rebuild the church, to help rebuild the church in the sense of, of Christendom. But I, I find it hard to believe that every single person would have that same attitude. So yeah. from that perspective, I completely agree. The It might be just as it might be maybe they'll be able to reproduce it exactly stone for stone, and yet it would it would be inherently different. I completely and, and, agree. And you know, and one of the takeaways for me is I didn't I didn't go, I didn't make it in time. I didn't get to see Notre Dame. I've been to other places, but I haven't been there. And maybe we as Catholics we should say to ourselves, hey, you don't know, <laughs> you don't know when when things are going to be taken away from us. I mean, the gospel reading on Holy Monday was our Lord telling Mary, who had been, who, and, and Martha, I, I'm not always going to be with you. You don't, you're not always going to have me. So when I'm here, take the time to be with me. And maybe instead of visiting Tahiti or going to the beach, we as Catholics should take our families on the expensive trips and use our precious discretionary income in a way that enables our children to look with wonder and with awe well, at our patrimony absolutely. before it's gone. I, I, when, when was the last time you walked into a church and you just spent an hour in awe of the beauty of a church? We don't, we don't have churches like that in the United States. There are beautiful churches, but there you you do not spend nothing time. takes your breath away. Right, the the, the you you go into uh, when I was in Notre Dame uh, when I was young. I was uh, uh, I believe I was sixteen years old. Um, I sat for over an hour in the in in the cathedral in in one of the chairs in one of the transepts, and I just. Look was looking specifically. It's amazing when you when you sit in silence what you start thinking of. But I was just looking at the four main pillars that are around the 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 uh, the transept of the, uh, the the center of the church, and I would just I was staring up and down, up and down of these four pillars that they were so magnificent. They were just solid, strong, immovable. It was a perfect meditation on the permanence. Of the cath of the Catholic Church that we have uh, that 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 exists that God has given us that is not going anywhere until the end of time, and th- these are things that you will not be able to see in 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 other churches in the United States. I promise you that if you are able to somehow find a way to get over to Europe and to especially to take your children with you, that is an experience that they will never forget because this is like you said, Mike part of our Catholic patrimony. This this is the treasure trove of Christendom, and it is slowly, slowly fading away as time goes on, as 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 cultures are other cultures are moving into Europe and and swarming the streets and overrunning the populace. Um, it, it's it's a real problem. And if anybody questions beyond that, all you have to do is go to Paris and uh, see the hijabs yeah. everywhere and, right. you know, uh, people who are, you know, from you know, other countries just roaming the streets and you wonder where the French people are. Yeah, well, the mayor of London is is Islamic. You don't see children. You don't see children. There are no children. If you see children, they're from another country outside of Europe or they're American, some American child that, was, that came along with their parents. You don't see French children. Yeah, well, it's very scary. you don't see French families because you don't see... A birth rate because you don't see a marriage rate because you don't see. That's it. The faith. That's it. So. I, I I hope I I I mean I I I can only hope. But it is it's an impossible thing to hope for. But God is God is good and God um, can allow great things to come out of great tragedy. I I, I do with with you and Tom hope th- of of good coming from this. Um, th- this is not just an event of thinking of a church just building down, burning down. Th- this is much, much, much bigger than this. This is what we're trying to get across to our listeners here. This is, this is much more than that. And 
don't don't let this 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 historical marker in the fabric of time disappear in your memory. The the news is going to stop reporting this in a week. It's going to be over, mm-hmm. and you won't hear about it till they finish doing whatever they're going to do with it. After uh, what yeah whatever they're going to do with it, don't forget this moment. This is a turning point in history. There are other incidences like this throughout time where places are destroyed and it is a cultural shock. It, it changes, the, it has the ability to change the direction of history. As a Catholic, you will never forget where you were on the, on the, in the moment that you found out that Notre Dame was burning to the ground. And let us hope and pray that the fire that burned that beautiful edifice will be the same fire which rekindles the faith of Europe, the faith of the French, and the faith of all Catholics around the world in our hearts and in our minds. 